Welcome to the Arena Decklist Podcast. I'm Jerry Thompson, joined as always by Brian Gottlieb, and we are not recording live this week. Uh, maybe at some point when we get onto a fixed schedule, everything's a little bit easier. We'll be able to do that. But right now, uh, schedules have been a little hectic. I think more so on Brian's end than mine, but it just means that not a whole lot of people were showing up when they get like the last minute notifications. We're going to bench it for now. Just for a little while. I, I think, like you said, when we can pin things down a little bit more, I, I do want to come back to it. I was having a good time doing it. Just my my stuff is super hectic this week. My my parents were just here. So I had a, a long sorry. week. Yeah, it was it was a lot. Uh, thank you for your apologies. Um, but it, it was good to see them after uh, a pandemic and uh, a year and a half of not seeing them. So don't don't say after a pandemic like it's over, man. I, I know enough. that wasn't. Fair I didn't know that wasn't your no, intent. No, you're, but you're you're exactly right because I, I think that is dangerous to just like declare victory, right? Like things are certainly getting better. My parents are both fully vaccinated, which is why they were able to come out. Awesome. My my wife and I have been our first stages of vaccination, so we decided we were comfortable enough in that scenario. And also, you know, we still it wasn't like we were out in the streets partying when they came. We still kept to ourselves and did some hiking, nature stuff, but we weren't in bars or stores or anything like that so still playing it very safe but you're right that the more we're just like oh this is over then those crappy behaviors start sinking in and then it's not over that's that's the way this pandemic works right is if you don't respect it and then it comes back again and you just got to kind of take your time do all the steps so i appreciate you correcting that language i do think that's part of the battle yeah and like i said i don't think that that is what you meant by it but like i think that that is the takeaway that some people could have so it's like yeah i want to I want to just be clear what our position is in case, you know, you don't know us. Um, right. I think that that is important. So I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Worth clarifying. But yeah, once once all this settles down and my schedule looks a little bit more normal, and although I, I do have uh, a move coming up, I my, know. my stuff gets picked up on June 2nd. Okay. And then I move across the country again for the third time I've now moved cross country. So... You're just uh, catching up to me. That's all. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to live up to your example, but that's gonna that's gonna be weird in terms of maybe doing a show from a hotel room or you know maybe finding a guest host for a week. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But definitely some disrupted times coming up for us. Listen, when I asked you about it, you said we'd figure it out. Yeah, well, figuring so, it out might be a guest host. Who knows? Well, I I would need to think about that. So, okay, okay well, start next. start thinking about it. Just you know toss it around in your head. I don't know what the situation is going to be because we keep throwing ideas back and forth about how we're going to do the move. Now, we're our stuff is getting shipped, obviously, so we're not like driving a U-Haul or anything, but we are still driving across the country because we have our dog and Kai is now 13. He's not in great shape. He has he's, arthritis. He's and not getting on any planes. He cannot get on a plane, no. And even riding in the car is tough for him. So yep. a part of our goal is just like minimize the trip as much as possible and do it in like three days if we can. Just basically take shifts driving, drive nonstop, and just get across the country. Okay. And that scenario would be really hard to record. The yeah. other way it might go is that he just can't handle being in the car for that long and we have to stop over and over and over and it takes forever to get across the country. So yeah, I was kind of thinking it was going to go the other way where you're like, ah, we're just going to do like some five hour days. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know which is better because I, I think the more time he spends in the car, the more anxious he gets, the harder it is for him. Um, so it, it's I don't know if it's like a per day thing increases the toll like seven days of traveling is worse for him than just three days yeah. of hard traveling I, I i just have to play it by year and see what happens see what happens so i don't have a lot of clarity as far as how that's going to go yeah that stuff's tough i don't i don't have any answers to that i i did the, the cross-country move uh with three cats and a dog in the car once and that's wild yeah i looked into you know like anxiety meds there's a, a thing called like a thunder vest which mm -hmm. uh, you, you just talked about buying a weighted blanket you know so it's basically kind of like one of those very similar yep yeah and tried tried a bunch of stuff all of it just sucked none of it worked they were all of the pets were miserable i i understand i get it and i hate to have had put them through that you know yeah I, I wish i could do something that would alleviate 
the pain and the stress and everything, but I don't know the answer. Uh, no, and, and poor guy's done it all these days. Like he, he was born in Las Vegas. So we got him when we lived in Las Vegas, moved him back to New York. Then he drove from New York. I mean, first he had to go live in New York City for a while, which is like a huge adjustment for a dog, right? He went from having yeah. a backyard to having to be on walks all the time. And then he moved all the way across the country to Seattle. So he, he's been through it for sure and has been a trooper through all of it. But we're, we're asking a lot of a 13-year-old dog for this trip. Well, you know, Godspeed, my friend. Thank you. I'm sure Kai appreciates that. He'll, he'll be glad to hear he has your support. Yeah, I love Kai. Kai is, he's, he's a Kai good is dog. Just, he's just a good boy. Yes, very good boy. Uh, but yeah, we'll we'll figure it out. I don't know if anyone has any particularly strong feelings uh, towards who they would think would make a good guest host. I guess hit me up. But oh, I can't wait to see what the internet comes up with for, yeah. for your potential guest it's, host. It's, it it's dangerous. Anyone. It's dangerous. It, it's one of those things where you're like, hey, can I get your input? Because I'm just going to ignore all of it and just do whatever I want. <laughs> see. I, I get that, but someone could have a legitimately great idea. And then I know you'll pay attention to it. I think the majority of the ideas will probably be ones you discard pretty quickly, but maybe somebody will just have a really cool thought and you'll be able to do the show with someone uh, that we wouldn't have thought of. Yeah. I don't know. I, my, I'm leaning towards just like picking someone from the discord. So, okay. I like that. We'll see. I mean, I, I would, I would prefer to keep our streak going. I know that we've had, you know, some breaks here and there. I, I took very few. I, I mean, I think I think you've missed like maybe three episodes in our three year run, and I think I've missed one, maybe two. I can um, I can think of one, and that's it. Okay, yeah. So, uh, so we we've had some we've had some good consistency, I think. And if you gotta take a break, you gotta take a break. That's the way I feel about it. I I think you know driving across country for a week. You know, that counts. It qualifies. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. And if you go to the Arena Deckless Employee Handbook, that is actually an accepted reason for time off. That's so. allowed. That's number two. Right. What's number one again? Remind me. Do, do your homework. Come on. <laughs> My fault. My if fault. I if I were clever, I could have made up something good there, but I just blanked. So yeah, I'll, I'll I, just put the blame on you. I didn't want to test you there, but uh, I guess it's, well, it's not too early in the morning. It's about five o'clock your time over there. So I think, I think death is number three. Okay. <laughs> Good. That, that's that a, that's a worse excuse. Nice. Anyway, magic. Sure, we could talk a little bit about magic. Why not? So historic is mostly the same. Yay or nay? Yay-ish. Uh, I I think like some things are still being unpacked, but there wasn't a lot going on this week to move things forward. Um, I I think like rogues. Still at the top of the charts for me. Still a lot of things to explore with the mystical arch archive stuff. And I think people are still piecing through that. Uh, I now fully respect green white as an archetype. It's, I'm not even putting qualifiers on it anymore. I, I just get that I don't really understand those decks by looking at them. And I, I do now believe the deck is quite good and will continue to be. And the metagame will have to evolve around that. And it's doing so. But there's no real hard movement this week to really report in on, I think. Yeah. So we talked about modern last week, which leaves us with standard. Time for standard. And uh, I, I think standard's good. Good-ish, right? Would you agree with that? Uh, depends on your definition. Okay. What is your definition? Uh, and is it colored by the last two years? It is colored by the last two years. <laughs> okay. For sure. Then, uh, then the definition is like, yeah, this is, this is fine. This is good. Yeah. And uh, just just a format that I want to play. Uh, that's really what it comes down to. Like I'm I'm willing to sit down and, you know, as a casual activity, I, I'm always playing standard because it's so important to my work. So I will be in the queues whether I'm happy or not. Uh, but if I'm just willing to play games for game's sake to enjoy them, then I'm willing to declare standard pretty good. And I, I play some games in the standard and I, I build decks and I think it's it's all respectable. Even even the core archetypes are mostly fine uh, there's some things i would certainly change but uh so, some of them are really good I, I think white decks in standard right now are interesting for white decks maybe some of the best white decks have looked in a really long time and i'm happy to see that so uh there's small little nodes of progress and i think sort of masking a lot of that progress continues to be thrown a veldrain and that's why we avoided this format when usually week one, new format, you go, yes, time to talk standard. And we went to the standard deck list and there was nothing, 
nothing new or interesting to talk about. And if you look at the standard results this week, I mean, there's points of brightness, there's points of new decks, but the story is still very much the same. The same archetypes are going to define this format until there is a major shakeup. And I don't think there's any way around that. Yeah, I agree. I think that the more reasons people have to actually work on standard, the more the the format will move forward. I think that there is a lot of stuff from Strixhaven that is largely unexplored. People have mostly just been copy pasting last format's decks. And uh, those those decks are really good, obviously. And Strixhaven mm-hmm. is kind of weak overall for standard. So it makes sense. Like that is both the easy move and the thing that, you know, if you're wrong, you're probably not that wrong. Right. right. So I understand why people would do that. If there was a pro tour, I would, I imagine the decks would look a lot different, for example. Okay. But you know, there's just like some smaller tournaments and I I've been watching like a lot of streams. Like, yes, I've been, uh, you know, playing, I played a lot of historic when that came out, I've been playing standard recently, but I also watch a lot of streams when like I'm writing my articles or, you know, just taking a breather or whatever. And there's just like no one streaming standard. There's very, very few people. And that's, that's part of it. It's like the, the standard streamers are like trying new decks and iterating on them. And they do a lot to shape the metagame generally right. when there aren't any big tournaments happening. So you're not seeing a lot of that either. So I, I think that there's a lot of reasons why things have just seemed somewhat stagnant. Do you think that's uh, more a function of the contrast in change to historic where there was a tremendous shakeup? Or is it just even if there wasn't that shiny new thing over in the corner, interest in the standard would probably be down a little bit? If so, like brainstorm and faithless looting are super shiny, right? Mm-hmm. It's not like oh, you know, historic anthologies four. If it had twenty good cards in it, like solid cards, I don't think you would have seen that huge of a disparity. But there was a lot to get excited about in the anthology or in the archive, rather. So I get that, but also with Strixhaven, there wasn't a whole lot to be excited about for standard. So I, th- I think it's a little bit of both. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like you like you mentioned, there are uh, a couple examples of hope, at least, within the last week's results. Uh, you do your column on Star City. This week's column was titled, and I'm going to take a deep breath here. Take air into those lungs, breathe in nice and deep, and in- go ahead. Innovations. In Strixhaven Standard from SCG Tour Online 5K Strixhaven Championship Qualifier Number Seven. Title pending. We we, we got to come up with something catchier there. I don't think a lot of people are referencing that one by name. No, probably not. But yeah, you go over a lot of the decks from this qualifier, and there's also some Magic Online results. Which, granted, like the the Standard League has four decks posted compared to the. 80 to 90 or so we normally talk about for every modern deck dump. So, mm-hmm. uh, and I, you know, standard is mostly getting played on arena, not necessarily right. magic online. So that's, right. that's fine. People still show up for the standard challenges they play. Leagues. But yeah, you go through uh, a bunch of interesting decks in, in this article. Yeah. Uh, so basically if you go to the top of the metagame, Things were very, very stagnant, and uh, I don't, I don't have my article open in front of me. But essentially, there was like three players who didn't play any Strixhaven cards, and the total number of Strixhaven cards it, it was extremely, extremely low. And I, I thought maybe one of the lowest I had ever seen. So that's what was going on in the top eight of the tournament. But if you start going a little bit deeper. And you go into the satellites, which I, I I do both. I look first at the primary main event because I think that's like the the hardest litmus test for a deck to pass. I, I think you can get your 5-1, 6-0 in a qualifier with a suboptimal list a lot of times. But once you get to the main event, it, there's a little bit higher of a bar to go ahead and secure one of those top 12 berths. So I always start there. But where that doesn't lend itself to a lot of fruit, we go into the satellite results. And in those spaces, there was good stuff going on. Uh, Nothing that looked like it was quite ready to set the world on fire with, I think, one big exception. And there's a deck that you and I actually both love, which is just now coming onto the radar. And I want to spend a bunch of time talking about it because I think, one, 
it's a deck that people aren't going to expect that you and I both love. I think they would expect us to be dismissive of it. Really? Two, I think so. I think so. Two, I think it's very, very good. Like legitimately, potentially tier one. So, and it's not getting that kind of press right now. So I definitely want to spend a lot of time on this. So I wrote about this this week. Uh, I, it's not my number one choice or anything, but it is, it is definitely very, very good. This is uh, Sultai Titan's Nest. And I think the reason that people might assume that we are going to poo-poo on it is because it's kind of like a do-nothing meme deck. Is that was that your assessment? It's, it's a little gimmicky. Like it, it feels a little gimmicky in a lot of ways. And, you know, where we talk a bunch about never being the smaller mid-range deck, this sort of has that flaw. Like if, if you're no. end game. Well, hold on. I'm going to explain why it doesn't. But on paper, the end game of Immersion Ultimatum from the Sultai deck is like a one card win. You do your seven mana thing and the game is over. And here you're sort of asking for little bits of value to accumulate. The thing is, the way you can go about accumulating that value and the window that you can potentially explode in is actually very small. Or excuse me, it, it's it's very easy to open up. And also you're able to keep up shields while doing it. So you've completely changed the paradigm of I have to resolve this seven mana thing to if I resolve this four mana thing, I can play around your seven mana thing. I can stop you from doing your seven mana thing. But my thing's still coming. And I have mana open to play through your mystical disputes, to play through your disruption, to fire back with my own disruption. And that completely changes the nature of how these matchups have played out. For such a long period of time, like all these emergent ultimatum decks had to have some way to just not be Dobbs to a here's my seven mana thing. Is this good enough? You had to shift in some ways in post board games. Even if you're still trying to resolve an ultimatum or two, it's like you're not going to just jam into a world where everyone's bringing in a bunch of counter magic against you. So this deck having new ways to go about creating that large end game by piecing together your shark typhoons, by piecing together uh, your important large cards. It's really, really important and really paradigm altering, I think, for all of Standard. It is. Uh, the main takeaway for me for this deck is that it, it is one of, I think, maybe only decks in the format that can win if your opponent resolves an Immersion Ultimate. Okay, yeah, that's been my experience as well. And like, Clearly, there are games where that happens, right? Where it's like, you know, maybe your opponent is almost dead on board or something and they ultimate them and then you're able to kill them through it or you're playing a mirror match and both players have a bunch of like binding the old gods and sweepers and stuff like that and they're able to fight through it but a lot of the time you're getting such value from the ultimatum that it's really hard to come back from especially if they have follow-up after it you know it's like yep. it doesn't it doesn't kill you on the spot it's not a one card i win it just means that them winning the game within the next two turns is going to be trivial. And with the Titan's Nest deck, it's like the best thing they get is Epiphany, Onyx, and Tybalt, right? And you just don't give them Epiphany, and then you yep. just don't really care about the other two cards. Uh, I mean, I guess if you have a stock graveyard, they can get Vorinclex, Tybalt, and then maybe you have to do something else. But even even if it's like, all right, Juffle back in your Valky, you can have Vorinclex, Alrens, they're probably still not doing anything worth noting on their next turn. So that's like, even if they resolve it, I mean, a lot of the time you're just like, I'm going to sit back, draw cards. If you do anything like cast the seven mana card, I'm, you know, going to be able to dispute it or negate it or something. Right. Especially in a post board game. Yep. And so they, they just have inevitability. Uh, and if your opponent does tap low or tap out for their ultimatum, you playing like Titan's Nest, Shark Typhoon, Alwyn's Epiphany, not that hard. GG. GG. Yeah, it happens over and over. That's been the play pattern that has mostly defined this matchup for me. And I feel extremely advantaged against other decks, not only uh, things like Emergent Ultimatum, but anyone who's really trying to control the game. I think the fact that you're able to shift your key card to the four mana slot is such an advantage and something that the other decks just can't do right now and uh, gives you a lot more flexibility in the matchup that they just don't have access to. Do you, do you want to kind of just lay out the foundations of this deck just in case people haven't seen it before yeah so uh titan's nest is a sultai four mana enchantment that you can exile a card in your graveyard to add a colorless to be able to cast a spell that doesn't have x in it 
So it just gives all of your spells delve, basically. You're built around that. You have a bunch of stuff that draws cards and fills your graveyard, thirst for meeting, reign of revelation, strategic planning. Uh, a lot of lists are playing curate. I think that card is pretty mopey, but whatever. And then you just have removal spells and then Shark Typhoon, I'll run some uh, Professor Onyx is the new card, but I don't think that it is necessary entirely. So uh, this deck could have existed last season, honestly. I think so. I, I think that's fair. Uh, I've appreciated Professor Onyx. I think it matters in some scenarios, but you're, you're right. It's not required. And I've seen some lists play one. Uh, the sort of default list that I started working on was from uh, Jason Cho, and they played it in the uh, eighth satellite and had two copies of Professor Onyx. And that was sort of what drew my eye to the archetype, frankly. Like that's, that's the upgrade from Strixhaven. But you're right. It, it didn't need it. And this game plan was already pretty solid, especially when the context of what everyone else is doing starts to become very clear. And, uh, you know, you're, you're happy to play this deck against things like uh, the aggro decks because you do have a good selection of removal spells for their key cards. Faceless Haven, uh, plenty of answers to that are, are present in the deck. So Extinction Event, Shadows Verdict, all those things are still here. You have your sweepers. It all kind of lines up really well right now. Yeah, I don't, I don't think the aggro decks are a buy or anything. No, 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 definitely not. But you play them solid. Yeah, but but if so, if my list uh, went a little bit heavier in removal so that you could be a little bit better against them. And my logic behind that was like you sideboard for rogues, like you need a, a sideboard plan against them. Mm -hmm. And Sultai is is going to be a good matchup. Like obviously, you can still lose. They have their own disruption and everything. So it's not that uncommon for them to just like duress you a couple times and resolve ultimatum and you don't have your combo together or whatever. That's that's fine. That's going to happen. Uh, but yeah, I think if you're leaning your deck towards beating aggro, you just you just get to do that because you're naturally so good against everyone else. And then I think the adventures decks are the hardest ones outside of like the fringe archetypes like rogues. I think my sideboard plan is really good. And Adventures is the one that scares me because they have aggression and counter spells just like rogues, but they, I don't know, they, they just have like a little bit more staying power. And like for things like rogues, it's like you can just duress them and resolve a Titan's Nest and then a lot of their cards just don't do anything. Yep. Uh, whereas Adventures is like, well, you know, you can brazen power to bounce the nest and uh, maybe all runs Epiphany catch you off guard there. It's like they get to do powerful things and just have as much interaction as you do basically. So it's that, that one seems tougher to me. I would agree with that. Uh, just more powerful spells and you're, you're kind of limited on counter magic. You're not super thrilled to be playing on the stack. You can do so, but it, it, there's good windows for them to resolve their key spells. And the fact that they just do more powerful things can be problematic for you. Um, one of the shifts you made in your main deck talking about accounting for aggro a little bit more that I really liked was the addition of Witherbloom Command. That card's been very important for me. Uh, how's it been in your experience? Also very good. I mean, it, it kills most of the early stuff that you're actually scared about. Uh, yeah. It's it's less good against rogues than a spot removal spell would be, uh, just like another Heartless Act or Eliminate or whatever. But it's a removal spell that's also good against Sultai. It's a removal spell that still you know, contributes to your game plan as far as milling yourself, picking back up a land. I have not bricked with it. I don't know what your experience has been. Haven't like, bricked. Haven't okay. bricked. Yeah, I mean, with, with Fable Passage, I think it, it makes it so much easier. It does It does kind of mess up your mana, honestly. Uh, like, once you have Titan's Nest on the battlefield, you are basically only constrained by blue mana because yep. all your payoff cards are blue. And your your forest, or if you play like a pathway on green, doesn't really cast any of the meaningful spells onyx changes that a little bit where now it gives you a threat that that works off of black but again i, I like kind of moved away from onyx when i realized that it just it wasn't necessary it was more like just kind of cute so wither bloom command does you know it's got pros and cons but uh overall i've been very happy with it yeah th that's a good starting tip when you're just picking this deck up uh prioritize your blue mana over everything if you can just continue to make all of your pathways produce blue you almost certainly want to do so that's that's how you go ahead and win games and it's where you will be pinched on later turns so having to make the green source early uh, it, it can be a problem but for the most part you will just then never play another flipped 
pathway on the green side again if you have the option to. And, you know, if you draw the forest, obviously that's where you're starting to get multiple green sources in play and you don't want that. And I also notice in your sideboard, you were pretty cognizant of this problem where a lot of people are playing Elder Gargaroth. You backed away from that. And is that primarily because you don't want to get double green or is that just because you don't think you need it? Honestly, like the the double green thing, I didn't even really consider, but it is definitely a strike against it. My main rationale was that against uh, decks like Adventures, like they're they're still going to have Brazen Borrower and stuff like that, you know, and Disdainful Stroke and whatever. Like Gargaroth is not that good against them. I just wouldn't even want to bring it in against them. And then I feel like mono red can kill you before it they can kill you through it if mm-hmm. they get to stick like torbrand and an ember cleave uh you know like gargaroth and a pile of removal is definitely very good but it's not it's not like this i win button against them which i think is you know what the the original people who are building and playing this deck thought of the card as it's like oh you just slam this and you win and it's like that hasn't really been my experience against these decks I, I think Elder Gargaroth is a particularly different card on turn five than it is on turn four, which a lot of the decks that lean on Elder Gargaroth, they have access to it on turn four. Yeah. Uh, th- this deck is not going to. So that factors a lot in how much I like the card and does bring it down a little bit. So I, again, I agree with most of the moves you made here. I've also remembered to post this immediately over in our discord and put it up in standard deck list because people you know mm. we talk about these decks and then they go well where are the deck why why can i not find this anywhere it's, it's listed it's in the standard deck list right now uh it's in my star city article yeah go, it, go it's somewhere buy, go buy premium or just no. read brian's free articles <laughs> right that, that's never our intention to pay get anything we want to share all of our decks we just uh are are dumb and we forget to put them up in the standard deck list channel so it's there now i've already posted it cool 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 uh yeah, Gargaroth, it just it doesn't it doesn't win games. And the thing, the point about ramping is definitely true. I kind of poo-pooed on Shadow's Verdict a little bit in my article because of that. And I have three extinction events, one Shadow's Verdict main, and then more Shadow's Verdicts in the cyborgs. They're like that much better against Acro as far as just like cleaning up almost everything. But mm. you can't rely on just that card like a lot of the Sultai decks did, because you don't have the ramp. It's right. just too slow. Right. Uh, that tracks to me. Yeah. So I just went through and uh, decided what I needed my deck list to look like against a lot of these decks and uh, built my sideboard around that and just made sure the numbers were right. And boom, perfect deck list. Uh, none of the matchups. I was like, yeah, I really want two Elder Garter off here. Yeah, I, I think that's fine. I think you have good plans everywhere. Uh, I am both enjoying playing this deck and finding success against basically everything. I I think you're in every matchup. Certainly, like, I don't know that this will stand up to hate. Like, if this becomes the de facto version of Sultai, I think there's a lot of moves other decks could make that could potentially uh, blunt the impact of this on the format. But as far as, like, a great choice for last week and probably a great choice for anything you have going on this weekend, I I am behind Sultai Titan's Nest 100%. Yeah, the other Sultai deck that has kind of been cropping up more so on Magic Online is just this weird control version. And there's a bunch of different versions, too. Some are, like, really counterspell heavy. Uh, one of the ones that won a uh, challenge last weekend is a Urian deck with no no extra Urian's main deck. A lot of the other ones I've seen have had Urian's main deck, but this is yep. just four Gargaroth, four Cultivator, two Coma, and then a bunch of just counterspells and removal and stuff. And, you know, still doing some amount of ramp with Wolf Willow Haven and Binding, but no Cultivate or anything. And this is one of those decks that I, I could actually see beating a Resolved Ultimatum too. So, like, if that's the plan for the Mirror, is just like, all right, be more threat dense, uh, stop their Ultimatum if you can. But even if it resolves, it's like, all right, we'll just, we'll just pick it apart. You know, we'll get two for one or three for one or whatever, and we'll, we'll just keep fighting with our threat dense deck. And hopefully that all works out. And it's like, okay, that that's a plan I could see working maybe. I think in general, I would rather have something that like clearly dominates them, like Titan's Nest, or just have Ultimatum because it's easy mode against the Agro decks. 
Yeah, I mean, that brings me to my next question is that if there's all these other forms of soul tie, where does that leave the ultimatum decks since they are, I would say, bearing the focus right now? I think a lot of the metagame is dictated by what those decks are capable of. So that being the case, is it, is it just time to jump ship or is there still a reason to go ahead and play that version of soul tie? This is just the soul tie decks cannibalizing themselves, I think. Yeah, yeah, it kind of feels that way. They're jumping through so many hoops just to like try and beat the mirror and... I'm not sure that ultimately it's worth it. Um, I mean, like Cultivator definitely helps you a lot against aggressive decks and Gargaroth in these decks is certainly very good against aggro because you don't have the random seven mana cards clogging up your hand, right? Like you have a bunch of early interaction to actually slow the game down and make it so that uh, Gargaroth is potentially a game winning card. So Mm -hmm. I think that that plan makes a lot of sense against them. Uh, I'm not really sure who Coma is actually good against like rogues kind of if you're forcing their hand with gargaroths and stuff it's like a fine value card a fine top end but it's not like oh yeah this is the top end that i want like this is the seven mana card coma uh i haven't played it much in this context but i've been dabbling with some transmogrify decks lately i hate coma it just dies every single time I play it. Like, I know there's games it takes over. It certainly it's beaten me enough times where I'm like, this is the correct call. Every time I put it into play, it has basically the collected company disorder where my <laughs> comas are stone garbage and everyone else's seem completely fine. But when I play it, it just dies immediately. And, you know, maybe if I'm lucky, I had to, they had to untap before they killed it. So I'm going to get a 3-3 on their turn. And that's what I walk away with every single time. But uh, it, it's not getting the job done for me right now. It's funny. I think in the first few weeks, you could just jam Luca into Teamer Adventures and, you know, like turn four, turn five, coma them, and they they wouldn't have anything. But mm-hmm. now, from me, like playing against those decks a decent amount of time, I'm always like, all right, I need to save a Heartless Act in case they do this or a Giant Killer in case they do this. And then obviously you still need some stuff to deal with whatever is left over. But right. I think now the plan for Teamer a lot of the time to just be like, Make your opponent hold on to that card. You play Luca and you just plus it because the plus on Luca is completely reasonable in that deck. Sure. Yeah, that's one of the good advantages for that deck, I think, is that they are able to use Luca. And that's not something you've often seen from Luca. We've we've all done a lot of empty plusing of Lucas, knowing that nothing was ever going to come of it, uh, just as a defensive measure. So it, See, it's back, nice. Back in to the find- day, back in the day, I was like, I'm just not even gonna plus it. Sure, just sit on it. Yeah, well, because it was just like milling me. Yeah. No, I hear you. There's definitely times where you just sit on it. Uh, so it, it hasn't really had this moment to shine as sort of a mid-range tool, I guess, where it's just generating some good old-fashioned card advantage. And this is these Teamer Adventures decks with Luca are one of the few instances it has been able to do so throughout its time in Standard. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure what to think about these Saltai decks. If you go through and look at the, the Standard Challenges from last week, you'll see a bunch of different versions that are ultimately trying to do basically the same thing. and. Yeah, I mean, this this deck did win the challenge. Um, I'm not, like, these decks are all real decks. It's not like, you know, these people did not show up to play or whatever. So, clearly it's got some game. I just don't know if it's technically correct. Time will tell. I, I will certainly be keeping a close eye on this portion of the metagame going forward. Uh, as far as rogues, not much has changed. It's still very good. I think that... If you are trying to resolve a seven mana sorcery against rogues, that's kind of a tall order. If you shave that down to like a four mana enchantment or maybe a five mana creature or something, uh, Mm -hmm. or bleed out their heartless axe and then play coma, that's probably a better plan. So maybe not just to get an advantage in the Sultai mirrors, but also for the rogues matchup, I think is a pretty good reason for the Sultai decks to try and diversify at this point. Sure, that tracks. And I think Rogues continues to be the same deck it has been throughout its time in Standard. It rewards extremely high levels of mastery. You'll go and look at its win rates throughout the week, and it posts like a 46% win rate generally. And then when there's a big event and chips are down, Rogues wins routinely. And in the hands of very experienced, very competent pilots who make small adjustments to their deck on a week-to-week basis and Nothing has changed as far as that goes. It's still a completely reasonable choice. If you have the reps under your belt, if you're comfortable with the play style, there, there's nothing wrong with this deck at all. Don't don't buy into the 46% matchup stuff that is uh, reflecting a broad array of experience with the deck. 
It is 46% if you are not eking out those small edges and like playing super tight. Mm-hmm. I think so. But if you are very, very good with the deck, your, your win rate is going to be 10% higher. Yeah, that was kind of the rep with fairies for a long time too, right? Is that it was just known as such a skill intensive deck, but then there became a reality point where the cards were so much better than anything else you could be doing. It just didn't matter. I don't think rogues is there. I don't think it has that level of just raw power uh, that it's able to account for some poor play in a lot of instances. You you really do need to know this deck very well to find success. Yeah, all, all I mean, most of your cards are one and two mana, right? It's like really hard for you to be relying on power level at least with fairies it's like you know bitter blossom beats some people straight up you could just yeah. triple miss by and click someone or whatever you could draw multiple cryptic commands and win a race that way it's like there was a lot of power tied up in that deck and rogues is very much just about sequencing and maximizing your cards and knowing your role figuring out when you can race whether you're racing with like life total or milling uh the, the sideboard decisions matter a lot the mulligan decisions matter a lot. everything just compounds upon itself and it, it's one of the hardest standard decks that we've had to play in a while agreed and for people who like that kind of thing it, it's really uh shown as a beacon of i can find deck mastery still and and lean into this arch- archetype so don't be surprised if your experience uh playing this matchup the, the thing you also see is people are like i have a a great rogues matchup and then the dedicated rogue pilots are like i beat you all the time this deck's fine it's it's, it's not a troubling matchup and you see these arguments happen back and forth all the time. And both sides are probably right. You're, you're crushing the average rogues player and the best rogue players know where to get advantages in the matchups. Yeah, that's why I like going off of true matchup. Like where, when, where, when, do, where do we have that? Is, is that over in our Discord as well, where we have the true matchup percentages that nobody else actually gets? No, no, but it's just like when you're making a decision for what deck to play in a tournament or uh, how to build your deck as far as you know like what you're trying to fight it's like you shouldn't look at like your matchup against uh, a person who is just going to give you 10 percent equity every time because that's not very helpful at that point it's like your numbers are going to be good regardless of what you play right so Mm -hmm. try and figure out the optimal thing assuming you know like say say you're playing salt eye and you know that the field is going to be like 15 20 percent rogues or whatever it's like well what if your rogues opponents are all very good, then what is your deck supposed to look like? And I would try to get a close enough approximation to that as possible. And then over the course of the tournament, you're probably going to get percentage points uh, from your opponents like spewing and making small mistakes and stuff like that. Um, But when you make the top eight or top four or whatever, and you play against a rogues pilot who is very good, I mean, why do you want to prepare for basically like a matchup that you're not going to play against if you're going to try and win the tournament, right? Like there's not going to be a bad rogues player in that top eight. So why are you preparing for bad rogues players? Right. If I could sum up your stance, it would be take those points. Don't count on them. Don't use them to go ahead and and sway your decision making. Just let them be added to your win percentage in the back end of the tournament. Yeah. I mean, if you want to be like all fancy about it, that's how you could say it. Sure. Well, Jerry, that's literally what my career is based on. I just (laughs) say what you say in a fancier way. And for some reason, people think I know what I'm talking about. All right. Well, you you can edit my tweets from now on. Uh, I have a hard enough time with my own Twitter account. I don't think you need to. I only tweet once every two weeks, man. It's not that hard of a job. Yeah, you know, you know, my feeling on uh, work and (laughs) existing and getting anything done ever. Yep, I do. I do. I, I share roughly the same feelings. So, okay, good. Anyway, uh, try try to beat the good people. I think that's a, that's a good plan. And if you are basing what you think the matchup is on your results from like silver or platinum or whatever, eh, maybe maybe don't do that. Maybe try and find a friend who is good at the archetype and will play test against you, and you can figure things out. Because like when you play those games too, and like your opponent's making like these small mistakes. It's never like, oh, I could have lost that game if my opponent did like these three things differently, right? It's always just like, well, I won because I'm great. And then they, they just like ignore the the other aspect of that. And it's like, well, if your opponent is also great, you're going to need a lot more help. So do that. What was, it, what was the matchup we played a few standards ago where people were so polarized about what was happening in it? And I played, I, th- I know I played the blue white side. Do you remember what you were playing when we did this? I was playing Team Eric. Team Iraq, right. And people were so convinced that the matchup was like 60, 40, 
on both sides, everyone's like, I crush this, I crush this. And then we played against each other and we're like, yeah, this is a, uh, this is pretty close. I, I think like maybe slight edge here, slight edge here. But it, the, the truth of it was, it was just a very uh, tight matchup with plenty of decisions on both sides. And when I played it against you, it felt totally different than playing it on ladder. And I think when you played it against me, it felt different than playing on ladder. And there was, there was some different truth to be found if you went a little bit deeper in the story. Well, you were, you were also a big jerk and played like, Three oh Dovin's Lord. vetoes made. I, I played the one board. extra Dovin's veto from the stock list because that's exactly what I would have done if I was building my deck for that week. Yeah. It, okay. So that that is case in point of like me playing against someone who's smart, right? Like, yeah, you could look at it that way. No, it, it is because if if I were playing on ladder or playing in like a low stakes tournament or something, I would expect someone to have like an untuned, unprepared list, right? So it'd be like you know, one, one or two vetoes main and like another one in the board or something. And instead you were like two, two or three, one. And right. it was like, that was, that was really frustrating. Uh, it, it was a big difference maker for sure. Especially the way those matchups played out. Yeah, it was huge. It was like, oh, well against blue white, I can always get away with only playing three expansion explosions. Cause like the game goes long. It's kind of a dead card, et cetera, et cetera. And you would just play these games where like, I mean, granted you knew my list, which is kind of how we play magic nowadays anyway. Right. At, least, at least in tournaments and you're just like well i just i just they used one expansion and i have two vetoes so i'll just keep four mana open and i can never lose you know it's yeah. like that was my only win condition it's, it's stuff like that where it's like you were able to draw vetoes early enough where you would just lock me out and it's like that's because you were good and you understood what was going on whereas i think anyone else even if they did know the deck list might not pick up on the fact that like oh i'm like light a win condition and blah 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 and they might just like counter a wilderness wreck when you just didn't have to for example right yeah i i think this stuff matters so much and it was one of the things that i you know it, it's rare that i take the time to toot my own horn but when i was doing really well in the fandom series it was something i was doing a lot uh, i remember a game I, I played against like uh brad early on in the throne of eldraine format where i i knew how many negates were in his list and i, I was playing dance and i'm like okay well i'm just going to uh, accumulate resources at some point i will have one more dance than he will have negate and then i will win the game and it, it played out exactly in that fashion i just did everything possible to draw negates out wait until he had none left and then it was like there's nothing that can happen anymore this game is won, and all i need to do is play towards this point from the beginning and i think the more you get used to open deck lists the more you see opportunities like that arise they, they do come up quite often especially right. when you're in these scenarios with huge haymaker effects and counter magic it, it's just obvious there's going to be mismatches sometimes yeah so yeah that, that set was interesting uh it was just like yeah it was it was close right but like if i were playing someone who wasn't as good as you i'd be like 70 30 80 20 something like that and the opposite was probably true for you yep so uh that is that is typically how testing goes. And rather than just be like, oh, well, I, I win 70% of the time I play against this deck, you know, you go through your deck tracker or whatever, and you just like spew off stats. It's like, no, like what what actually matters? How good was the caliber of your opponent? Is that caliber going to match who you're going to play against in this tournament, et cetera? And you, you have to take those things into account. Focus on getting that good data. Not all data is good. You have to make sure you're, you're filtering out the nonsense and, and getting to useful conclusions from your data. Yeah, I mean, if if you played like Rogues Against Sultai and both players were just AIs that did things at random and then you like took took the numbers as a result of that, it's like, that's not good data, obviously. You know, like you, you'd be able to realize that. And it's like, it's not quite that bad uh, taking data from a lot of these tournaments or whatever, but it's definitely not optimal. It is closer to optimal than it is to AIs doing things at random, but it's still not perfect. Yep, I'm with you. Anyway. Good spiel. Uh, let's talk about adventures. What version of the 30 different adventures decks do you like? I like the Is It Adventures deck, which is uh, really just playing the two adventure creatures and not a true adventures deck. Those are good creatures, to be fair. They are good creatures. Uh, I it, It's weird to say that when I am just a tremendous believer in Edgewall Innkeeper. Uh, I, I don't doubt that card whatsoever and i would say the same thing about lovestruck beast it's it's a tremendous card but for whatever reason the style of uh the magma opus galazeth prismari and accelerating a bit into your 
uh, Goldspan Dragons has appealed to me. I, I think it's a little bit more tempo-y. Uh, you have the tools to control opposing um, edge walling keepers. So to, to me, that stuff has been lining up a little bit better with the format, but I don't know that results actually bear that out. And I think this is a case of maybe taking some uh, take some a, bad data here. Yeah, like, take, a, take a step back. Look, yeah. look at it like holistically from your experience with like how you think your deck should be built versus how you think their deck should be built. Right. Exactly. Uh, Exactly. I I have a lot of issues with, is it mainly that you don't have like those clean draw engines that really force the issue? Like you're, you're starting from behind a lot of the time because your, your deck is a lot slower. You do have some early interaction and stuff, but you really need to lean on that stuff. Mm -hmm. and if you're able to like kill their first couple things and make your land drops and your mana cooperates and you don't draw like seven magma opuses or whatever (laughs) then your deck has the potential to play out really nice and really fluid but there's not like a a brainstorm or looting type of thing like fire prophecy is okay if you want to go that hard or whatever but you know like you do have some consistency issues and i think that those are real but I've definitely played more matches against Is It in the last week than I had, you know, the last six months or whatever. Right. And the, the the deck was good, you know, it was coming at you from a lot of different angles. It's like, well, I need to this is for me like playing the adventure side of things, right? It's like I need to put them under pressure because their late game is kind of scary. And then I need card advantage to fight through their removal. And I need to be able to answer dragon so I don't get tempoed out by like dragon time walk. And then, you know, if magma opus starts happening, which has, it's, it's real. It does happen. Uh, then like, you need a way around that too. And it's like, that's, that's a tall order. And obviously all of their stuff needs to come together for any of that to matter. So the correct default, I think is just like aggro, you know, yep. like you just get under them, make it so they can't get any traction. That's fine. But yeah, it comes at you from a bunch of different angles. And even when games got to like in top deck wars, like their card quality is huge, right? It's like they, it's have, very good. they have frostbite, some counter spells that maybe don't line up, but then their deck is just like adventure creatures, dragons, Prismari Command, which helps them filter, Magma Opus. They have uh, creature lands and Faceless Haven. Like their, their card quality is absurd. Yeah, I, I think it is. And one of the big points that has shown through for me in playing is it is the reach adding so much reach to the deck via magma opus uh via prismari command which can go face you know the all these little points of i can do damage to you without having to worry about keeping a creature on the battlefield or participating in combat uh that that stuff matters a lot and you know some of my early versions of the deck were, were playing the uncommon uh i don't i don't know what we're calling these treasure making spells uh that does actually five damage and lets you go and look at the top five cards of your library creative and- outburst I, I think that's what it's called. Yeah. And I've ultimately moved away from that card, but I will say that playing with that much reach in my deck was sort of incredible. Like there was just a lot of times where I would five someone on their end step after they tapped low and use that to go find the other five damage and, you know, 10 someone out of nowhere without even having to participate in combat. And that's not something we really do anymore in magic. Like the reach has definitely been toned down. So getting access to the, that sort of play pattern again especially at instant speed uh felt really nice to me now i i think there's too many demands from the rest of the format that you just you have to have some sense of fairness you can't just jam your deck full of seven and eight mana spells or you'll get caught um but to your point talking about the ability of aggro to just be the way to go ahead and answer this and and pressure this deck I, I also like the sweeper that this deck has access to. Uh, draconic something. I'm, I'm blanking on it at the moment. I'm going to look. I want to say so intervention. You are, right. you are correct. It's, it's draconic intervention. Yeah. So that's the uh, sorcery additional co- cost to exile the spell. Exile an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard. Then deals X damage to each non-dragon creature where X is the exiled card's mana value. Uh, if a creature dealt damage this way would die this turn. Exile it instead. And then you exile draconic intervention. And this card was a solid sweeper for me and especially when i was doing the creative outburst thing and had access to you know six of these treasure pitch spells as long as well as prismari command which is just another fine card you can pitch uh behold the multiverse is another sweeper and you have access to this on 
turn three, because you are able to make your treasure with either Magma Opus or Creative Outburst, I felt fine against aggro, quite frankly. And I don't think most decks are built in the same fashion my deck was. So I could understand why some other decks are starting to run into a little bit more pressure because they're playing more saw it comings and fewer uh, ways to actually interact on the battlefield than I was. So yes, you're going to have that problem. But if you needed to shift this deck to go ahead and account for the aggressive decks, I think you could do so very easily. Yeah, I've seen copies of that in the sideboard very rarely in the main deck. Mostly people are just like, I want to do the cool thing, you know, and not really, of course, not really planning on being like, okay, well, what do I need my deck to look like? If there's a bunch of aggro, which, you know, there, there still is, right? So, yeah. uh, my experience playing against that card <laughs> has been kind of weird though, where it's like, I have to live in constant fear of it. But at the same time, there have been a lot of instances where, and what was I even like seeing there oh, from Elite Spellbinder? I'd see their hand with Elite Spellbinder, mm. right? And then I would just like look at their graveyard and they just have like a frostbite or something. <laughs> it's just like, God. Yeah, this not going to get the job done. Yeah, this is so awkward at times. So uh, a lot of that comes through in deck construction. I think Prismari Command is probably the right answer where you you shouldn't go that hard and play like creative outburst i don't think but prismari command is like a, a good enough bridge you know it doesn't kill everything it doesn't kill lovestruck beast or torbrand or whatever uh but the exile is nice for things like annex and i think that you can do stuff to make that card actually work and have it be good and then obviously in the mid game if they they have like a dragon and you're in kind of like the stalemate or or whatever and they have that uh it's just lights out obviously yeah yeah, I've had that scenario come up several times. I guess I, I guess the thing with this deck is like if it comes together, it looks great, but there's sure there's just so much awkwardness that you know you, you just have to do your best to build your deck in such a way where it comes up less and less. Yeah, and, and I'm uh, I'm not convinced that the way the default version of this deck is presently being built is the right way to do it. I, I think there's some flexibility and people should go back and look at some of the choices they're making in this deck. Because if, like you said, if you just look at the power level, it, it's all there. And, you know, we t we've talked a few times about expressive iteration at this point. It's good in this deck. It, it's really good in this deck, quite frankly, and uh, does a great job of getting you through both the early and the late game. So I, I've been impressed. I like this deck a lot. I wouldn't like be pushing people towards playing it in a tournament because i do think it has to figure out some of these issues but if you wanted a deck to invest some time in and figure out i think you would be completely reasonably served by putting in time with is it dragons aggro decks mono red mono white the one thing i'm gonna say about mono red is that hall monitor is solid yes 10 one drops feels like too much do you have a preferred one drop suite? Are you just fervent night hall monitor? That's it. Pack it in. Uh, I mean, fervent champion. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think you want you want four fervent champions for sure, and then I think it's like two hall monitor, two fire blade charger, which seems weird. Um, but you could play a third copy of one or the other if you wanted okay. to. Like, you don't want to draw two hall monitors. I think just drawing one is completely fine. But I've played more and more against people who I think are just playing Sandy Dogs list that had 10 one drops. And their their like mid to late game has been very, very bad because they just keep drawing one mana one ones. Mm -hmm. So it, it feels like too much to me. Uh, but Charger, Charger solid and Hall Monitor is very good and has like, you know, messed up math and has messed up hands where I was like, really relying on love struck beast to like at least two for yep. one them or like hold the ground or whatever and it just gets kind of invalidated so yeah i think i think that's about it otherwise you know deck is solid whatever i i'm on board with that 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 works for me as a sum up of mono red now you get to go off about mono white uh, look i just really like this deck i i have been playing it a lot uh it rewards classic magic i think is the term i want to use i mean so a lot of times when i'm playing this deck i just feel like i'm playing magic from 10 years ago and a lot of the small decisions matter and you're you're planning several turns in advance and you're disrupting your opponent and trying to negate what they're doing while at the same time advancing your plan i mean it almost feels 
Jundish in a lot of ways, which feels weird to say about the mono white deck. And I, I guess it's lacking like some of the reach that Jund would typically have. But th there's a lot of the same vibes where it's able to go between a few game plans. Uh, and I think it's very good. I think it's very solid as far as lists that I like right now. I'm into the idea of just maxing Paulos and then playing some Magistrate's main. I think those two cards in conjunction with each other are far more solid than I gave them credit for. Like I, I knew they worked together, but I don't think I really pieced together how impactful it was going to be to just play your Magistrate and then go ahead and Elite Spellbinder, the card that you know was set to undo whatever it was you were accomplishing. And they don't get that back as long as that magistrate remains on the battlefield. And you have so many high priority targets that unless you're getting a huge payoff by targeting that magistrate, like unlocking your ultimatums or something like that, it's hard to throw your removal in that direction. And all the while, it's either clocking or, you know, playing some limited defense. It, it does exactly what you need it to. And it's keeping things close against the emergent ultimatum decks. Uh, another reason to kind of diversify a little bit for the Sultai list is that I, I do think there are more Dranith Magistrates present in the metagame at the moment. So maybe being a little less vulnerable to that card is a, is a point in your favor. So really good flexibility from this deck. I appreciate the play patterns and have enjoyed playing it immensely. How much of the old Dark Confidant Castigate, like black white decks did you play with? Very little. That That is mostly in a period where I was not playing much magic. I, I know what you're talking about. I certainly came back into the game just as uh ravnica was getting ready to rotate so I, I i was slightly familiar but not hard invested in them i played a lot of them and that was kind of like i i played some aggro in tournaments but that was really my foray into aggro decks that can lean more mid-range if they have to mm -hmm. and then that kind of translated into playing like Murloc Paladin and Hearthstone and stuff like that. And I really like those decks a lot. And that's what this white deck reminds me of. It's like, it is, it is fair, good, clean magic. You're playing some creatures that are, you know, sort of annoying, basically. It's yep. just like, yes, you can kill them in various ways. You can uh, brick wall them in various ways, but like each single card that you play kind of wants your opponent to answer it in a different sort of way. And then, you know, you have Faceless Haven to use your mana going long. Yep. So it's like yep. you, you have like the early aggression, you have some interaction, you have some sneakiness about you, and then you have, you have Faceless Haven, right? And that's like kind of all you need for a top end. And yeah, it just it's very reminiscent of those decks, even though it's like, obviously you don't have Dark Confidant or Disruption and Castigate or whatever, but like the the play patterns are very similar in like how you approach the games and uh, just like try to cut your opponent off of outs, basically. Yep. Yeah, that's that's a great way of putting it. You're always like, OK, how do I just make it impossible for them to actually win this game? And you combine your Alciads and your uh, selfless saviors and all these little pieces add up to something more. And if you distribute your uh, aspirant counters perfectly, then eventually you'll find a way through. And the, the, doing all the math, figuring out the long term game plans has been very fun for me. I've wanted to write an article about decks like that, uh, basically because of how much I love them. And the term that I came up with, which is very apt, is just kind of silly, I think, because it's a keyword in magic and it's just flanking. Like flanking is exactly what you're doing, playing those decks. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good summation. You're just trying to get wider than what your opponent can account for and add up those little bits of value all over the place it's it's a cool way to play magic for sure yeah uh cycling this okay this is the part of the show where i'm just going through everything even though i don't believe in any of the crap that comes after this i just that's a psa okay what happened to cycling we you and i were singing the praises of cycling just a few weeks ago uh it's okay that's all i got Okay, that's <laughs> that's fine. I don't have any real way to differentiate from what you're saying. Like, so rogues doesn't have the power level of fairies, and cycling is very much the same way, except it power spikes at zenith flare. Mm -hmm. And improbable alliance is like kind of okay, but at this point, people. I don't think that card beats anyone anymore. Yeah, people know what they're doing against it. Yeah, and 
You see a lot of adventures decks not playing Obosh anymore. We're not seeing like the Ember Cleaves in the sideboard and just like purely targeted hate or anything, but uh, there's still enough respect out there. And yeah, it's just one of those things where it's like people play against it more. They understand what's going on and, you know, they know how to sideboard. Maybe it's like, oh, you just keep in like a couple of negates for their, their Zenith flares and you'll be fine. And it's just like that tiny amount of thing just like, changes the matchup a little bit and the cycling decks are so confined right it's like every single set they're not going to get a, a single new card right so it's right. just it's just kind of stuck in what it is yeah everyone else should be getting better they are mostly standing still that doesn't mean this deck is dead and can't find a window to be the best choice uh but i, I don't have a lot of evidence that makes me feel like that moment is right now and i i guess i shouldn't really frame it like that because a lot of these decks also did not get new cards but in terms of like sideboarding too, you're very constricted. So if if someone else is sideboarding a little bit differently against you, you still can't do a whole lot. And it's like they're they're narrow in that scope too. Which kind of mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, I'm looking at like a sideboard from the challenge right now. It's like negate, shredded sails, red cap melee, vanishing light. It's like, all right, cool. That that sideboard's not beating anyone. Yeah, you, you know what you're getting, and uh, it, it's just some very limited answers that play, don't really fundamentally change your game plan. You want to play cycling, play best of one. How about that? Okay. That's Good my advice. Summation. Good advice. Rakdos, or Sacrifice, or whatever. This is just one of the archetypes that there will never be a consensus best list. Yeah, so a, a lot of these lists look like the pre Strixhaven lists, where they're just. Croxa decks and uh, doing claim the firstborn village right stuff. I think that remains fine. If there's a a bunch of rogues floating around, maybe you could even talk me into it being a really good decision. But it, that's got to be a metagame call, and I, I don't think anything has large enough uh, percentages of the metagame where that's the reason I would want to play this deck right now. The other thing that's happening in the Racto space is that people continue to work on Plum the Forbidden and. This was a card you and I were just here a couple weeks ago saying very, very good things about. I think I still feel the same way. At the same time, I'm going to acknowledge that I don't think we have figured this deck out yet. I don't think anyone has figured this deck out yet. Uh, you know, in the the main event for the Star City City tournament this week, there was a You have to refer to it by its full name. I can't do that. I don't even <laughs> Star City. Championship qualifier number SCG, seven. SCG tour, tour online. online uh, I'm, I'm going off memory. 5K Strixhaven championship qualifier number seven. No, wait, say it one more time. Hold on. SCG tour online. 5K yeah. Strixhaven. Yeah. yeah. Championship qualifier. Okay. Okay. Number seven. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know the name of it. Good Easy. job. Easy game. You nailed it. So in that tournament that Jerry just mentioned, uh, 15th place. Johannes Albreed. Sorry if I mispronounce your name, Johannes. Uh, it is, it's a plum list. I mean, it, it looks like a lot of the foundation we've laid out. There's some uh, Amerstrom Predators, which we weren't super high on. There's there's no Witches here, no Sedgemore Witch. We're just going back to good old fair Wolf Strider. And then a couple extra one drops in the form of Serrated Scorpion using Extus, uh, probably more often using the backside of Extus yes. to go ahead and get some closing power. And this looks like exactly what we we're talking about. And here's a really solid result for it. I, I think actually missing the top 12 on breakers possibly. So, you know, things break a little different. Maybe this wins the tournament and the entire narrative is different. There's things I would improve about this list. There's things I would do differently from this list. And I think everyone basically feels the exact same way about their plum lists. We certainly have to figure out how to build this deck properly. If we ever answer those questions, though, this deck is just super powerful. And, uh, you know, someone was messaging me today saying they 5 0 the standard challenge very easily with it. Yes. And we're, this was the Croxa version I posted, or excuse me, not Croxa, uh, Corvald version I posted. They said that they thought it was quite good and overwhelmed all of their aggro and adventurous opponents easily. So I think all of these paths have to be explored before you write this archetype off. But I am acknowledging that we have not figured it out yet. And I don't think this is among the best decks in the format, but I do think it has some of the highest potential in the format. So the problem is that I think my decks were good, except I couldn't really nail down the Sultai Ultimatum matchup. 
Mm-hmm. Now, if people start moving away from Ultimatum, I am okay. interested in these decks again. Yeah. Claim, Village Rights, A Crow in War, and to a lesser extent, Plum, being another sacrifice outlet, is very, very good. And it's it's slightly less good against Sultai. Like, your, your claims are dead, but at least the other cards all have text, and people are trying to, like... Elder Gargaroth you, and it's like, that's just never going to work. Why are you yeah, trying? Yeah, does nothing. Uh, yeah. But like the rest of it, I couldn't really figure out. And against Sultai, I was so close to being able to get to a point where the deck was built in a way where uh, you could just burn them out after they resolved Ultimatum. Yep. Because they're basically pigeonholed into getting Vorinclex, Kiora, Best of Sea God, and Alrun's Epiphany, which you shuffle back in. And then you have two turns. And it's 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 so close, man. Like just one more decent burn spell, and I don't think that Exodus really qualifies. It it might like if you save it for like exactly post ultimatum and have like a heartless act for their thing or whatever, you know, then maybe it can kill the Kraken token or something. I could see that maybe working out. My problem with it was like you can't. You can't really jam it at any point when they have open mana, right? Because it just dies right. to everything. Uh, but yeah, maybe maybe that's the way to go about it. I'm also kind of interested in just trying like four Immersion Predators in like a normal list because that's mostly immune to like Heartless Act and Shadows Verdict and stuff like that. Uh, but people moved back to Extinction Event too, so that's also kind of tough. So I don't know, man. It was, it was just really hard to figure out. Whereas you know, like rogues and the adventures decks. I was just like kind of farming them uh, and not really thinking much of it. It's like, yeah, my deck's doing what it's supposed to. And it was like, I just have to crack the salt type, right? But yeah, if, if they move away from it, maybe maybe you're just golden. Yeah, I, w- I was so deep in my sideboard. You know, I, there was times where I was like for Royaling Vortex and still playing Necromentia, trying to get the salt time matchup under control. And like you said, always feeling really close about it like it just was so so close and certainly winning from time to time doing exactly what you described burning them out yeah uh, i mean i i was winning some some of the time too uh you know it wasn't like 30 70 it wasn't that bad right but But there's no question they were favored yeah Yeah, no question they were favored i i agree with that entirely uh so you're exactly right if we are for some reason moving away from that titan's nest incentivizing us from moving away from ultimatum maybe there will be space for this deck to get its act together and uh, i will be excited to see that because i i love playing these decks i think they're so much fun and kind of unique in the shape of what standard has been recently and you know even if there's some common threads claim the firstborn village right stuff certainly has been around for a bit but the uh, bastion of remembrance just fireballing your opponent out from nowhere is really really cool stuff dude the problem i had with bastion was that it's like you're only good uh binding target and then sure. it's pretty easy for them to also like yuri in the binding so it's not like oh if i draw two bastions i'm good or if post boar you draw like a bastion in a vortex i'm good it was just like if they draw a binding your your stuff that is supposed to beat them just stops working basically and vortex was like it changed from like okay well I'll just jam this as soon as I have two open mana to I have to wait until exactly the turn before they have the ultimatum because uh-huh. I can't risk this getting binding. And then at that point, it's just like, why? Like, what? Maybe I should just be playing Necromentia, but Vortex seemed to go so much better with like the try and nickel and dime burn them out plan. Yeah. So, yeah, dude, there's, there's just so many things where normally it's, it's clear cut. Like, you can figure out like this is the way or this is not the way. Right. And a lot of it, I was still just like, I play a bunch of games. Games play out differently. I try more stuff. And at the end of it all, I'm just still scratching my head. Like, I have no idea if this plan was better than that plan or what. Yeah. Look, though, if, if they're not doing the Haymaker thing, I firmly believe you can grind them to dust. Like, yes. The the Exodus plan is is completely fine in those scenarios. You could lean more on Sedge, more Witch. There's so many ways where you can just punish them for trying to answer you, not even on like a one-for-one basis. They can have their two for ones with yuri and, and binding they can have their three for ones it, it doesn't matter you will be able to overcome that value it's when they do that and then compress the window to nothing is when yes. you really really struggle yeah exactly uh gargaroth coma those are your win conditions i don't care yep no, the care. question is if, if they're shark typhooning reliably off titan's nest and still doing a good job of squeezing the window are you actually advantaged there and 
Maybe not. So maybe, maybe that's still bad. Titan's Nest, I feel like you could sideboard around, but the, the cards that you'd want against Titan's Nest are so narrow, yeah. you know, that it's like... I, well, I think you just want to control their enchantments for the most part. Yeah, I mean, they can play around that too. I think that I would just want to arrest them a bunch, probably, and like maybe okay. attack their graveyard. Like Soul Guide Lantern to get rid of like 10 cards, maybe slow them down. Interesting. Like that, that could potentially do that. I think that that would be a good plan, but like that plan is also good against exactly them and basically no one else. Yeah, I will say for whatever reason, playing the Titans Nest deck, I have occasionally come up against Graveyard Hate. The, the most common version is like Elspeth's Nightmare. Um, but I, I've seen some Soul Guide Lanterns. I've even seen like a Tormod's Crypt or two. I haven't cared. Now, that could be very much a function of the matchup. That's not to say doing those things doesn't matter because if you're doing it with enough pressure, all the stuff matters. Yeah, different uh, different when they have a clock, but like if, if they just like nuke your graveyard once, Rain Revelation, Thirst for Meaning, Strategic Planning, you're, you're yeah, it, it, It's been very easy to rebuild. So uh, y- again, you have to find the sweet spot. It's going to be it's gonna be a lot of work, but I, I do think, the again, this is another deck where the work is worth it. Is it though? <laughs> Dude, I put in so many hours. I, I was going to like, write an article about this and just at the end of it i was like i can't draw any conclusions so i could i could lay out the various things i tried and like you know what worked and what didn't but i wouldn't have a list at the end where i'm just like this is the way to do it okay and and that was the problem for me i i I don't have a response to that if you if you did the work and came out with nothing that i'm not going to say you did it wrong you know and i i was right there with you playing this deck and and feeling like i couldn't put it together but the other thing we didn't have in that moment was like a pretty precise understanding of exactly where the metagame would go. You were just building broadly for power and less like I'm going to have to beat this with the exception of like, I know I have to beat soul tie and that's going to be a problem. If things get a little bit more precise, maybe that's the moment where you can really hone in and, and benefit from the hard work. If you play four claim, the firstborn four village rights, some amount of plums, depending on how your deck is built. And then like two, a crow in wars and two heartless acts main deck. With with any other amount of resistance, you know, just like creatures blocking. Uh, I was doing Retriever Phoenix with uh, the Burn Spell Igneous Ignition, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like that stuff all added up to like, I am just smashing creature decks. So you don't have to work that hard to be able to beat the creature decks. So then it is just figuring out where Sultai is going to be and figuring out the best plan for them. And if they're if they're doing ultimatum stuff, like you could just do kind of where I settled on where it's like, hope they don't draw binding or like you have to play this stuff alongside duress and hope to duress their binding or duress their ultimatum or whatever. And like, that wasn't uh, a plan that was able to like lock it up for me, you know? So I, I didn't feel comfortable being like, Oh yeah, this is the way to do it. But if you want to beat up on creature decks, this Rakdos package is good. I, I would still play a Crone Wars main deck. I think the card is so good. And then you have eight spells that sacrifice just makes it even better. And it just covers your bases against a lot of stuff, especially when the ultimatum decks were playing Gargaroth main. I, I want to ask one more question about this archetype. Just guess my own answer is no. So I am curious. I think your answer is no too. And I wonder if maybe we both made a fatal flaw. Did you ever try and do this stuff without adding lessons to the mix as well? Yeah. Okay. I didn't. I was, I was very convinced that you were supposed to do past summoning lesson stuff. Well, um, w- once you cut the lessons, I would be off of Plum. Okay. Which I think is fine. I mean, obviously we wanted to build around this card that we thought was powerful, right? Uh, but you can you can certainly build without it. I mean, I'm looking at like the eighth place stack from uh, Challenge last weekend. That's just Bone Crusher, Emberstorm Predator. Right. Good cards. Essentially. Skyclave Shade, Valky. Yeah, just you know, rares. And it's like, yeah, yeah. This, this looks fine. Uh, this is this is all old stuff, but it's fine. It, it, it probably works. Did, did the deck you're looking at right now play Plum? No. I wonder if there's just a way to do still do Plum stuff and play things that are getting smaller amounts of value than like a lesson. Like Elder Fang Disciple is probably a bad example, but creatures of that nature, a serrated scorpion where you're, you're doing a little bit more burn action um, and, and just like using Sedgemore Witch as your combo piece as opposed to going back to the Woe Strider stuff that a lot of people are doing. So you're still getting paid really hard on Plum, but you're not doing the lesson stuff anymore and playing the Mopers like 
eye twitch. Although I'm talking about replacing eye twitch with serrated scorpion. So how much have you really accomplished in exactly. that scenario? Exactly. Uh, yeah. They're they're all pretty similar. I mean, forbidden friendship and uh, hunt for specimens are pretty weak cards overall. Yep. Retriever Phoenix is like very solid. It is it is definitely better than a lot of people give it credit for. The problem is that you then have to play a bunch of Moki Blessings, right? Yeah. So I could see moving away from that stuff. You move away from Extus. Uh, but at that point, I'm not sure that I'm interested in like Plum, Sedgemore Witch, because Sedgemore Witch is already a card that I'm on the fence about. And the Plum stuff is less good if you have Bastion. Bastion's less good if you have like the two mana token makers. So I think it all just right. kind of comes together. But like this list where it's like all powerful cards, it's like, yeah, maybe that's playable. I don't know. Yeah, I'm I'm going to mess with this idea. I'm I'm going to build around it and see if I come up with anything that looks impressive. Uh, you know, moving to like maybe more Skyclave Shade and just always having something to dump into Plum and uh, maybe more spells. So where I'm able to, you know, more Heartless Act, uh, just generally good spells that I'm able to recoup value from my Sedgemore, which a little bit more reliably and see what I come up with. But I get the sense you're right. You you kind of want to maximize these things if you're trying to do it, and it'll be hard to get max value out of Plum unless you have that package with you. Yeah, I'm not trying to plumb away my Bone Crusher Giant, man. That doesn't. Yeah, seem you don't great. get paid very hard on that. Uh, one of the cards in the sideboard that's interesting is Shatter Skull Charger, which I did not try, which could have maybe done some stuff. Uh, you're gonna have to save me uh, Google yeah. and go ahead and read re- sc- Shatter Skull to. Charger. To me. I was about to one RR four three. Giant Warrior, Kicker 2, Trample Haste. Uh, if it was kicked, it enters with a plus one, plus one counter on it at the beginning of your end step. If it doesn't have a counter on it, return to its owner's hands. It's, it's Vichino Sandstalker. Okay. With, with Trample. Now you're speaking my language. Yeah. So like Phoenix, Ignition, maybe Bastion Roiling Vortex, although you could just try and like blank binding if you wanted to. And like maybe this was like the burn-ish card that I was trying to get in there. It's like... Maybe. It doesn't... F- check all the boxes where it's pretty bad post ultimatum. So you're mostly just trying to like aggro them early, like before ultimatum, which also could be a fine plan. But uh, like that card being present in the list is, it just makes it very clear that they're thinking about like, I need to get them dead, you know, as soon as right. possible. Right. Like right. I can't, I can't mess around with this grindy nonsense. You just have to kill them. Yeah. It's an interesting direction to take the deck. Uh Worth exploring as well, I would say. Last, but maybe not least, uh, Transmogrify uh, and it's, or it's Luka. probably least. It's it's probably least. Okay, so you posted a thing on Twitter, uh, also in in your article about emergent sequence and polymorphing into a Velomachus, and you said that you wanted to play it until you turned three Velomachus and still lost. My problem with that was that you were still playing 80 cards. I feel Correct. like it'd be way more likely for you to be able to come up with that sequence if uh, you just turned it down to six. Well, look, that would require me to make some hard decisions, and obviously I didn't want to do that. Um, th- there's a bunch of things I like about this deck being 80 cards. I There's a bunch of things I like about this deck in general. I, I think it's fine. One of the things I actually don't like all that much is Velomachus Lorehold. I just don't think the support is there right now. Like it's it's very challenging to find something you want to do. And my main payoff in my list is supposed to be Lorehold Command. Right. It's, that's sad. Uh, yeah, it's it's like fine and you are able to piece together wins, but nothing is easy with this deck. Like it's it's just never easy. Cool things that are going on here that I, I'll call out. Uh, Valakut Awakening with Velomachus Lorehold is like, if you have to play those long, long games, I've appreciated that card. Uh, I am playing some Mythos of Snap decks, which I think is maybe okay in this format, actually. Um, and it fits well with the general plan of what you're trying to accomplish here. I think that and that card is good with Velomachus, and if you have to cast it, you're losing. Uh, there's there's spots where, like, being able to make the choice... Like, I, I do have a Swamp in my deck, so... I know. Um, I, I am often able to make the choice, and I've had spots where that's that's been fine. <laughs> it is um, it is funny to me that in in defense of Mythos of Snapdex, you're like, well, I have a swamp, you know? Yeah, one swamp. It's it's plenty. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, it's certainly speculative, and I'm I'm not trying to say this deck broke it, but uh, what I think is interesting is the combination of Emergent Sequence and Transmogrify. Like that's a really small package for a turn three Transmogrify that is certainly reliable enough it's just 
what are you transmogrifying into? And if you move this deck to just go ahead and do coma stuff instead, maybe that's good. Maybe maybe that's just fine. Like doing this on turn three. Again, we talked about like Elder Gargaroth being a different card on turn four than turn five. And I spent the early parts of this podcast complaining about coma. But if it's on turn three, turn four reliably, I think that's a different magic card at that point a lot of the times. And you are going to be able to get it to be... Uh, uh, in a place of safety. So uh, I'm interested into doing more stuff with Emergent Sequence and Transmogrify, but these decks all have the same flaw, and it's that there's no perfect Transmogrify target. If we ever get one, all these decks are going to be so, so good. Uh, but they're just not right now. They they all have flaws. Yeah, Velomachus is good, but we don't have like the Time Warp type of stuff. Right. You know? Right. So, and I, I think that we're probably not going to get Oh, I hope. I hope not. I hope we're not able to time warp. Yeah, with, uh, I guess. Velomachus. I guess, like you know, knock on wood or whatever. But uh, okay, so assuming this was the plan, right? You Ravens warning, right? Mm-hmm. And then the turn that it alts, you transmogrify into Velomachus. Is there a suite of things that you could get for like the tutor on top of your deck of Ravens warning where it would actually be good? No, because I mean, like, I, I I got to, okay, so you get to set one card from your sideboard. So essentially it has to be your payoff, right? Like you need to get your five mana spell that you're going to cast with Velomachus. Yes. So I guess I now have access to every color, which certainly, I, I looked at every single potential option I could cast with Velomachus Lorehold in the Naya colors. I didn't expand my search to consider black and blue. So it is certainly possible that there's a five mana spell in those colors that will change my decision. Uh, We talked a little bit about like using things like the Royal Scions or Elspeth to make a seven power Velomachus. I think that's nonsense. I just don't think you're ever going to be able to do that reliably. It is nonsense. I can't I can't confirm it from like playtesting, but let's just call it my my intuition. Yeah, I, I think it is nonsense. And that means you're just limited to five mana spells. And at least in the Naya colors, there's a reason I have four Lorehold command. Is It's because that's the most powerful thing I could find to do. So if, if you got something better, I'm willing to hear it. But I haven't seen it thus far. Yeah, I mean, Raven Raven's Warning would mean that you are blue. And I was just thinking about, you know, is there maybe like a good sweeper? There's the Dragon Sweeper, which then works with the Transmogrify. So it's like, okay, that's kind of cool, right? You can yeah, do that. that's nice. Yeah, and non-dragon, sure. There, there are definitely going to be situations where, I don't know, maybe Mythos solve these, solves these problems where it's like you, you would have to like attack a Planeswalker, but they still have some creatures. I, I guess, when was the last time I played against a Planeswalker? I don't even know. Uh, but yeah, I'm just trying to think of like the different scenarios. Like basically, you would want something that would protect Velomachus mm-hmm. from from their turn and i'm not sure what you could do for that but yeah uh what about the cycling setups where you're just using like improbable alliance to transmogrify i would have to think about that some more and then- I, I was pretty focused on what i was trying to accomplish here um i've i've seen the improbable alliance setups again i i don't think that card is particularly good right now so that's a strike against it and i don't know i mean we're just going to get dream trawler at that point like that's generally where we're going no, now you, that we're you get Velomachus into zenith Lair. Uh, maybe maybe that's good enough I, I don't know. I feel like Zenith Flare is such a critical mass card that you just need to be doing the same thing on every turn. And as soon as you're deviating, even in the slightest, even if it's something as small as Transmogrify, you're setting yourself up for failure by having these, however many, probably six dead cards in your deck for Transmogrify to Velomachus. And also the fact that like you invest in these resources and sometimes your Velomachus just gets... Uh, you know, heartless act. And then that's when I'm glad that I'm playing the Yuri and like, you know, enchantment value stuff. And sure. I'm able to still piece together a game plan. Uh, and without the creatures that are usually present 
in the cycling deck, I'm not sure you're going to be able to piece together a backup game plan for that setup. Yeah, backup game plan is just Alliance Flare Shark Typhoon, I think, which which right. is not bad. It's not. It's okay. It's not it's the okay, worst yeah. thing in the world, but it like you need your you know like Fire Prophecy Zenith Flare stuff to be able to win games against aggro and stuff, and I'm not sure that it is. But. Yeah. Yeah, you would just have to rely exclusively on Zenith Flare happening early enough and padding your life total. And I, I don't think it's going to do both because like if you did the setup, that means you took some time off cycling and it's not a huge Zenith Flare. So uh, I am skeptical, but it's an interesting path to check out. I mean, you're still cycling, you know, I mean, you just you have Transmog and Bellamachus and maybe a couple Fire Prophecies instead of uh like Iron Craig Pyromancer or whatever nonsense people are playing. You know, you, you're you're down at maximum like eight cyclers yeah but let, let's just talk about the scenario where we're using like the, the problem is i'm saying you are using zenith flare as your anti-aggro measure so it has to pad your life total enough when you make that bellamachus that you're safe and if you have a perfect game you, you cycle something on turn one play yeah. improbable alliance on turn two cycle three things on turn three and then transmogrify on turn four are are you safe in that scenario? Even if you hit your Zenith Flare, which is like the only real payoff you have, right? Yeah, there's like the five mana tap and freeze two things, which is also not that bad if you're racing with Bell okay. Marcus. Yeah, yeah, that that's an okay, that's an okay hit. But so I, I'm mostly operating under the assumption that like Velomachus hits once and then dies, because if Velomachus lives against Aggro, then it doesn't matter. It can block and slow down them yeah it's, generally it's so anyway. huge you're gonna win the race you know you're you're casting free spells you get done tap and you still have mana to like yeah cast well, more things. one of the one of the points where that failed for me was against like red and ember cleave when i was playing this deck is like i would get in that setup i'm like okay i, I got my vela Maka, value i'm able to block on the next turn i'm certainly fine and then ember cleave was just able to evade my defenses yeah which We're, flare that's, that's those are ember cleave problems like that's not right. that's not going to go away for anyone flare so. and tap and freeze are both solid in those scenarios i will say but yeah yeah, yeah, I I have not tried this deck, but it, it did seem like fundamentally pretty sound for what it was trying to do. Uh, I just hadn't really gotten around to it. And I was wondering. If it, that's all. No, have not yet. But it, it's it's interesting. Uh, like we talked about, like after we lived through the Luca meta, we all were like, should we just be playing polymorph transmogrify and everything? And I, I do think you have to ask that question. It's an incredibly powerful effect. And there's good setup. Emergent sequences is, is really, really nice. So I wanted to do my due diligence on that. But what I found was like a very OK deck. I, I wouldn't advise anyone try and play this. And none of the other setups for transmogrify have impressed me any more than this setup did. Fair enough. Well, you should try it and report back. That's your homework. Okay. Homework assignment taken. Mine is continue working on Rakdos, I suppose. Sure. That sounds like a fair a fair homework assignment for this week. Oh, wait. No, no, no. No, you're not going to go away that easy. This is a heavy homework week, Gerald, because you know what's happening. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. No. It's next week. Dude, it's next week. I played a sealed, okay? Okay. What do you have? Do you have thoughts? It's it's not good. It's it's not good. This is okay. Wait, this is an okay format. I I don't want to trash this format, but it really isn't a good format. And we've had some good formats recently, so this kind of shines to me as very clearly not good because I I think it's very samey, and I think there's just like this lesson principle that overrides everything. All your cards are mole drifters. That's only amplified in the sealed context versus draft. And that's fun for a little while, but it's kind of like playing. What's the format that everyone loves that they always ask me to play? And then I sit down and play it. And I'm like, oh, I remember why I don't do this. Uh, I don't something know. Something battle box, battle box. Oh, where you have like the, the yeah, lands yeah, yeah. and ev everything's a two for one. And I kind of feel like I'm battle boxing sometimes when I play Strixhaven and it's fine once or twice and it's an okay format, but I mostly agree with you. Maybe we should just audible and not, not teach the sealed if people were, were excited though. I would feel bad. So the thing is, is that it's not super hard, at least from, from my experience. It's like you open your deck and you try and build like, you know, teamer card advantage ramp tempo thing. And that's about it. If you can't do that, I'm sorry. That kind of sucks. Uh, hopefully you got some some good white-black cards or whatever. But, or black-green, I guess. 
You know, it's like there's I don't feel like there's a lot I can provide where it's like, oh, you know, this card is like sneakily very strong or whatever. It's like everyone has kind of already learned this from the draft. Unless it's okay. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. I'm I'm gonna play a couple more seals this week. I have a feeling this is not supposed to be a full show because I, I basically agree with what you were saying. And if I don't have the enthusiasm to drag you through this, there's no way this is gonna work. So get me on Discord it, when you play. Okay. Yeah. We'll do a few games. We'll come back. We'll touch on the format next week. We'll at least give some thoughts. If we play and we figure out there's something else going on, then we'll do a full show. But I'm going to say it's probably more likely that we just check in on Constructed instead and do a few words about Sealed to get people prepped. Yeah, this is actually the worst, too, because uh, new Genshin patch just happened. Oh, there's a there's a whole new TFT set that I could. Be oh playing yeah, yeah, I saw and that I'm, too. I'm doing this stuff, so I I am right there with you. To say nothing of my ever growing backlog of PS5 games and Steam games and just a, a million Ooh. other things I could be doing. Ooh, did you play Near at all? I did not. Um, did you buy it? I didn't. I didn't buy it. I'm trying to slow down my video game purchasing because okay. my backlog is so tremendous. Did you get it? And what what format are you playing it in? Are you playing it on PS5? I am playing it on PS5. It's a PS4 game, right? It's not actually optimized for PS5? Correct, but it's also not really optimized for Steam. So Okay, fair enough. I think I think it plays better on PS5. I'm not sure about the PS4 version. There there is a lot of loading because it's like you it's like going to this house and you just have to load a bunch and you know. It's it's way more doable on ps5 than it would be on ps4 i'm sure okay is your review generally though positive i should i should be playing this it's it is a technically good game it is just uh this is such a glowing endorsement no no no, no. so this this is a me thing i think and less of a, a strike against the game where back in the day i would play jrpgs to completion happily mm-hmm and if there if there wasn't like new game plus or post game or secret boss or I was pissed because I'm just like what what else am I supposed to do you know and it's like those games are just slow right and right. this game is more of that it's like you know it the premise is good I I know a lot about the story and stuff because of Automata and being interested in uh the the game surrounding it and stuff just like the franchise in general so i guess i'm like not driven to play it based on story reasons or whatever but like the 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 gameplay is good you just progress slowly the first couple hours are just like a lot of fetch quests and like not really much world building or anything so it's it's like slow to get into but i can tell that it is a good game like i know that it's okay that was that was a medium medium recommendation okay so so think of the games that you really like that you have played that i have not played that i should like like yakuza i think is a very good example of this where it's like i should love that game mm -hmm. and i just never played it and that's a me Mm -hmm. problem that's not a yakuza problem right yeah okay it's the same thing with near Okay, but I feel like I have some of the same problems you do. <laughs> so I'm, I'm concerned that I'm going to have the exact same me problem that you have. Uh, you, you will almost certainly not finish it. Okay. Did you finish Automata? Did you even play Automata? I started playing it uh, twice, actually, and was, was very interested. But the PC version is not great. And that stuff frustrates me when there's a lot of great games and it, it crashes the all the cutscenes are like 30 frames per second and look terrible and low res and i don't i don't know why they have such a hard time with their pc ports but they just haven't nailed it and yep. in, until i got my ps5 basically all my gaming was done on pc uh, despite having a very old ps4 but so that basically disqualified me from playing the game and i i think because of that i don't have the same draw that a lot of people do because i know a lot of people love uh near like it there was obviously a, a huge hit of the last generation that sort of passed me by and i'm concerned that without that i'm not going to have enough to draw me into this which is a, a prequel right like this pre this predates it's, uh near automata it's a 2010 game right right yeah and a lot of times if you lack the nostalgia to go back for these things it, it can be tough um but then i just 
soared through demon souls and loved every second of it. Sure. So that's that's the counter example to that where you are able to put something together. So I think what I'm going to do, I, I'm trying to be more selective about the things I purchase. Not to say I won't ever play this game. I'm probably going to wait till it goes on sale or it hits like PS Plus or something like that. Because that's the other problem is that I have all these services now. I have the Xbox Live games and I have the PS Plus and now I'm gun shy to buy games because almost everything hits them eventually. Like I almost bought Horizon Zero Dawn probably 20 times for PC and it just came out free for right. PS5. So I, I'm happy I waited that one out. And I think I might end up doing the same here. Yeah. So for for Nier, I would expect that to happen. Right. Uh, you know, maybe not immediately or whatever, but it'll happen eventually. So if, if you can wait to play it, then cool. Just Just do that. But it's just my backlog is so large at this point that I, I have taken this new step of being. No, it's I'm good. Not, I'm not buying everything. I'm buying the things I want to play right now. The things I can't possibly wait to play because I'm so excited about it. Whereas I used to just buy everything, play it for an hour, and then it would get lost. So Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been trying to do that too. Like, I think I have a lot of stuff on Switch where I was like, you know, I'll, I'm going to play this with, with friends or whatever. And mm -hmm. that just never doesn't pan out it never yeah. materializes and a lot of that was like you know pandemic happening and me moving away from a bunch of people and whatever but uh i mean if if you all want to play like smash or you know smash mario karts uh enter the gungeon just like any sort of like multiplayer thing on switch i got you and no, I, have, I have all these games ready to go yeah so. if if and when <laughs> uh you know tournaments come back i'll be bringing my switch again and hopefully we can do that and less magic let's battle box type of crap yeah battle box is banned it's it's the era of switch when magic tournaments come back but no i like this i i would much rather like you go deep on a game i go deep on a game and we talk about them you know maybe it's the same game or whatever and that's cool too uh then right. you just being like yeah i tried that for an hour and bounced off it was really good but i bounced off and it's like dude come on yeah this new setup is working too because i'm getting deeper into games like i i beat demon souls i am very deep into spider-man now and uh next on my list is probably like disco elysium i really want to play through so uh i am hopeful that i'm turning over a new leaf and actually completing the games i want to get to now yeah for, for what it's worth for the near stuff it, it is capped at 30 frames but i believe that there is a somewhat easy workaround for it okay that it, it will not work for me if there's not i just can't yeah. do it no i, I, I can't do 30 yet i i understand that I understand. I, but, my PC snobbery rears its head. Yeah. So if you're not going to play it on PS5, if you want to play it on Steam, then just Google, make sure you figure that out, make figure out that it's doable, right? Before you actually commit. Got it. Will do. Sign us out. Game. Good luck.